Real life has shown me that there are more layers to functional relationships than movies and university mentality like you to believe. Sure, back in the day lessons about being proper were oversimplified and didn't take manipulative relationships into account or that you need to stand up for yourself against them. But then the pendulum started to swing in the other direction, the direction of rebellion, where even average confrontations started being viewed through the lens of toxicity and becoming hurt over everything became the new status quo. Turns out we're just as flawed as most people that we confront, but because we decided to become the main characters of our own lives, we don't consider others' perspectives. Being proper, as restrictive as our university professors told us must be, doesn't have to conflict with standing up for own interests. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I'm okay with having some likable qualities as social norms perceive them, but likability is not what I'm after. There's something deeper. No, I can't please everyone, but thanks to my philosophy, I've kept all of my relationships functional, and it's more than enough. So, let's unpack what I mean, and it's gonna become more complex as we go. Generally speaking, likable people have good habits that come from internal motivation. But even if you're not good at everything, at least you're willing to pick something up if someone asks you to. And it's likable too. Self-conscious people are usually aware of the effects that bad habits have on themselves, like procrastination, eating junk, spending all your paycheck away really quickly, etc. But are we aware of how our bad habits can affect other people? Can you welcome some embarrassment and correct the problem instead of jumping in to defend ourselves? For example, we get sick from eating a combination of food that we already know upsets our stomach. Or this happens after drinking too much alcohol. Either way, we have to depend on our family and friends to take care of us. But if they say that it can go on for much longer and that the problem could be easily preventable, we get upset that they're not sympathetic enough. So. The sun rises and sets, rinse and repeat. Our likability points go down, but it's not the likability that matters. It's simply a consequence of being careless about the preventable problem and then making it a burden for others. There is no need to worry if they're upset when you messed up. Some embarrassment is good for your soul. But if then being upset is a bigger problem than your habits, then a cycle of trouble will come your way. Now, I'm not advocating for being a suck-up for every trivial demand that has no effect on other people. I know, I might have a few habits that cause trouble only for me, or only teeny tiny trouble for others. So there's no need to be uptight about everything. What I also want to make clear is that I have compassion for people with serious illnesses. I know human suffering is part of our experience, and I'm there to help you out if you need it. But People who cause trouble like semi-intentionally, I don't know, that just defies logic. Okay, so let's draw an example from my life. You see, I have a lovely bundle of hair, but the problem is that it tends to shed from time to time. So I used to cook food for my husband with my hair down, you know, like almost every girl does on social media, and it just so happens that he would find hair in his food. So after a few embarrassments, he finally asked me to tie it back and wear a head cover while I cooked, kind of like what they do in restaurant kitchens. I fought the temptation to get offended and complied with the request. I did that because I know that eating food with hair in it is pretty gross. And at the end of the day, harmony was restored to the dinner table. So yes, that's how normal people react when you correct certain bad habits for them. I hope that wasn't controversial. Would you like to guess what would happen if I continued to defend my pride and made a big deal out of it? Well, I guess that I would look quite sadistic. There are valid reasons why rebelling against being a people pleaser became a trend on social media. Hence all the videos titled, How I Stopped Being a Good Girl or How Good Girls Finish Last. It's true. Some people can take advantage of our generosity by turning us into tools. Having a healthy dose of self-respect and the ability to say no can be medicine against that danger. So yes, corporate systems, manipulative friends, yes, even some family members, can ask you to do too many things to mold you into an image of their liking. 
But let's also be careful with making casual rebellion a trend. I believe that there is ongoing harm where these meaningful terms become trendy and then interpreted in many different ways, sometimes dysfunctional. You see, most relationships come with some friction, and what can happen is that people want to project their insecurities onto that friction, thus ruining the balance in a relationship. Some examples of these terms include toxic person, self-love, and setting boundaries. Good girl or people pleaser works in the same way. In general, it signifies the desire to be agreeable at all times because you don't want to upset anyone. But the gray area where controversy starts to brew is defining specific situations in which being agreeable is not a bad thing. Worse yet is bringing up the question of conscience. You know, wanting to do good because you care, not because of some external approval. So yes, I'll go there, one step at a time. Let's start with some examples where saying yes can lead to exploitation. Parents pushing you to have a certain career. Working overtime. A friend making a last minute arrangement to see you when you already made plans for yourself, rest included. Now let's look at some nuanced situations. I already talked about two of them in a part about habits. Maybe a passenger in your car asks you to pay attention to your driving after they see you making some erratic moves. Maybe you're keeping some expenses hidden from your partner because you like splurging and one day you are called out on your act. But even parents who are trying to coach you about your career are not always manipulative. It's one thing if they want you to become a doctor, for example, because they're projecting their dreams onto you. On the other hand, they might object you to pursuing a certain silly university major that doesn't lead to a fruitful career. Instead, they're asking you to explore other options, not necessarily high paying, just ones where you can find work so you can thrive in life. They're not trying to manipulate you to live their dream, but instead are concerned about your career stability down the road. I mean, you can always say no if that career is your one and only dream. But what I want to highlight is that these parents' advice is based on care for your well-being, not manipulation. Whether you follow it or not, you should still acknowledge their point of view and let life decide if you're right or wrong. There are times when I felt uncomfortable giving up some of my assumptions or habits, but that discomfort didn't last for long if what they said was realistic and led to favorable outcomes. But being rebellious more often than necessary can also feel terrible, not because you saw the other person's face go sour, but because of that voice inside your head called conscience. I know, I know. It's not an easy thing to define. It is often argued that conscience is manufactured from societal expectations, often unfair ones. I kind of understand where this is coming from, especially if the person has a rather by-the-book approach to ethics. So they follow rules from authority figures, whether politicians, religious figures, or counselors. It is also true that these authority figures themselves can be ethically weak or intentional hypocritical. They say be humble, but are themselves controlling. They say be generous, but are themselves greedy. The problem I have with this logic is that the cherry picks examples of hypocrisy to argue that these ideas themselves are pointless, when in fact they would do everyone good if everyone valued them. So what does it mean to have a conscience? You might be surprised that I'm not going to quote some famous scholar but that's because I've been paying attention to my own mind. So I found a process that can heal it. You see, I was full of love for everyone and everything as a child. My vision of the world was ethereal. Clear wonder, lightness, curiosity to be awake and present. And as I was getting older, however, I noticed this feeling, this love gradually fade from most moments of my life that coincided with my adolescent angst and negative emotions that started to creep in, such as doubt, cynicism, distrust, and apathy. At times, I would fight these feelings through tears, and that clear mind would return again. I was wondering why such a painful process could produce something so beautiful. Sometime in my early adulthood, I stopped chasing this feeling and gradually became ultra-rational. Not that there's anything wrong with being rational, it's just that my reason was disconnected from the spiritual part of the self. If I wanted peace, 
I would tell others to stop bothering me and just put on pretty music and go for a walk to a pleasant park. Probably the peak of that stage of my life was my year in Japan when I lived alone and surrounded myself with experiences that were pleasant to me on my own terms. But coming back home, I became my old self again, critical both of self and others, impatient, impulsive, resistant to change. I saw others as rude, boring, and inspiring individuals. So the change of scenery, which I now call manufactured peace, did not change me at all. It was all a distraction. Somewhere along the way, I remembered how I used to long for that clear-mindedness and decided to revisit the process. To this day, my mind ebbs and flows in different directions. That's because as adults, we have to put more effort into having that clear mind, unlike children who are innocent by nature. I haven't attained any eternal peace. I'm not a monk, that's for sure. But I believe that a mind that respects ethics from the heart, even if a reminder comes from the book, is the one that sees the world with beauty. No drugs, no blame, no special terms and conditions for others besides requesting them to be civilized. Just admiring the purity that rises and lands upon the ground like a butterfly. And that state, I believe, is the real driving force behind conscience. It's not exactly the same thing as being simple-minded like a child, because the rational side of me blocks intentional manipulation. And I also understand the limits of my body, so I can't be generous all the time. I can burn out, yes, and tell to others that I'm done for today. But the spiritual side of me allows normal, flawed people to mess up, to lose their temper so I can be patient when they come back to their senses, to be empathetic to others suffering, but hungry for their recovery. I don't need to guard myself against an average person who doesn't have any extreme personality traits or to assert that my interests are the most important. They're just as important as theirs because we're all flawed together. Sometimes I'm wrong, sometimes I'm right. Let the experience decide. In short, I don't care about being likable. I care about caring. When I visited my in-laws in Ukraine, I was struck by their casual family dynamic. At first, I was taken aback by the heated verbal exchanges, sometimes insults, and stubbornness over some issues. You would think that you walked into some dysfunctional household. But then out of nowhere, the same family members that fought an hour ago would sit quietly at the table, drink tea, make jokes, and create plans for the day as if nothing had happened. All their emotions evaporated into cooperation and friendliness. I believe that this dynamic is probably the best one I can think of. Certainly better than dissecting someone's mistake or only seeking company of pleasant, non-confrontational individuals. The reason being is that we need to accept most people as they are, sometimes kind, sometimes tired, and sometimes angry. We move on and stay friendly with them as they are to us. Of course, I wouldn't want to engage in fights often, but bouncing back from these when they do happen is still a great tactic. Those who have suffered abuse know that it was an ongoing pattern and obviously exercised great care to remove themselves from real danger. Yes, there are people out there who refuse to go with the evil inside of them and cannot be trusted. But then we have statistics like one in five people having narcissistic traits and it makes me scratch my head. I mean, yes, people are complicated, but that doesn't mean that these traits are extreme in everyone. I'm not deeply bothered by someone being a jerk when they're tired. I'll just have a normal interaction with them when arrested. We need to stop acting like we're saints ourselves and demand that others be perfect and nice to us at all times. Otherwise, we can't coexist. People can feel that energy from us, energy of cooperation or energy of uptightness. It's easier to get along when we take things lightly without overthinking. And it's nice to be likable in that sense because they feel that we accept them despite their flaws. And trust me, normal people will accept us too, despite saying critical things on occasion. Having a couple of negative opinions doesn't mean that they don't love us. You just have to look at the bigger picture of how they behave in different situations. But you can only see that bigger picture if you are willing to cooperate and leave your grudges behind. So after all this long talk that went into different directions, 
I didn't directly answer the question, what makes someone likable? Well, to be honest, that's because being likable is not the goal of life. We just can't please everyone. But at the same time, I avoided that feel-good, being-yourself narrative. Because I know that people can bring harm to themselves and their relationships when they interpret it in dysfunctional ways. The world is a complicated place, I know. And so are our minds. So far in life, I found that the balanced path involves a mix of self-assertion and self-sacrifice. It requires our minds to be light, but also conscious of potential traps. Not paranoid and not gullible either. Just listen patiently, reflect, and absorb. Even people who are well-meaning can be wrong. Perhaps we might reject their advice. But the idea is to always be open to the possibility to learn something from them. Whatever they say, or whichever way we react, will eventually be clear in the context of life itself. And that's why neither being likable nor being yourself answer these big relationship questions. So, I hope you like my rather complicated philosophy. Or you may want to debate me. So, feel free to share your thoughts in the comments down below. I welcome both compliments and challenges alike. You might have noticed that this video took a little longer than usual to come out, but that's because I decided to adjust the pace of my work to the quality of each video. So some of these will take a little shorter to make, some will take a little longer. I know my next one will come out in about two weeks, but that's because the idea behind that video is very special to me, and I want to be intentional with what I say, not because of some fancy editing or anything. So I'll take my time. Take care. And bye-bye.